I'm just so grateful this morning for all that God is doing. How many know it's come to that time of year that here in about 50 minutes my vacation starts? And so next week we're going to be out of town, so there's not going to be a service next week. But uh, just spend time with your family. Get into the Word of God and just see. Just I, I challenge you, just see how much of the peace of God you can get in your home next Sabbath. I want us to think that you guys can stir it with a stick. This week as I sought God, and I'm still kind of dealing with the fire thing, you know, and, and uh, I think when we deal with the fire of God, it shouldn't be an extraordinary thing. It should be a common thing for the people of God, yet we have lost it. And so God's been dealing with me about his fire. He's been dealing with me a lot of what is going on in the earth. How many know right now uh, there's a lot of crazy things going on? We're seeing prophecy begin to be fulfilled at an alarming rate. And uh, I'm still trying to get a, uh, to me it almost looks almost like we're getting ready to go into the tribulation period. Yet at the same time I'm sensing God saying there has to be a great revival first. There has to be a purified body that can actually show the world who Jesus really is. And so there's this dichotomy going on. Of How many know that a lot of the church is showing uh, all different kinds of Jesuses in the earth? Uh, in fact, I, I am dismayed that one Pentecostal denomination has so embraced Marcionism that they are now saying even on their national websites that the Yahweh of the Old Testament is an evil God and Jesus is a different God. How many know that's a different Jesus because Jesus is Yahweh Elohim come in the flesh? He is the God who delivered Israel out of Egypt. He is the God who gave them the commandments. He is the God who told Moses, go grab your pen. I, got, I want you to take some dictation. That's the Jesus that we serve. And so God kept taking me back to Hebrews chapter 11 or 12 this week. And so I'm not going to jump around. We're going to stick with Hebrews chapter 12. I want you guys to open up your Bibles. And even for the, uh, the DVD, we're not putting up slides because I want you to read in your own Bibles. You know, one of these days, if we don't have electricity, PowerPoint's not going to work. But an interesting thing about a printed Bible, all you need is a candle to see it. All you need is a little sunlight to see it. Now, when we pick up in verse 12, he's talking, he's ta this great cloud of witness he's talking about is all those in chapter 11, the great hall of faith. Some saw great miracles. Some saw uh, the, the, the re their dead raised from the dead. They saw kingdoms topple. And others, their faith was so strong that they refused to budge even when threatened with death. They refuse to budge on kingdom principles. They refuse to budge on who the God of the Bible is. And God called that just as much faith as the guy who walked on the water. Come on now. And it says, wherefore, seeing that we, have, we, we, are, we are also compassed about with such great a cloud of witness. And I, I even look at just the, our, our past history in the last 2,000 years, how many know that there, at the beginning of the Reformation, and now they may have not have known all the Hebrew that we know, they may not have known all the Hebraic heritage that we know, but one of the things I find as I read some of these great men of God is they have a greater dedication and a greater respect for God and a greater holiness than even many of us could ever demonstrate today. How many know that's also a cloud of witness? I pick up Spurgeon, I see a cloud of witness. I pick up McLaren, McEachern, and many of the others of these great men of God. I see a great cloud of witness. I pick up Strong's, I see a great cloud of witness. I mean, that we have encouragement. He is faithful, and he's called us to faithfulness. Now, look what it says here. Now, guys, this, this speaks to this day. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us. I, I want to highlight something for you. Every one of us, from the day that you were born, had the sin that so easily besets you. For some, it's greed. For some, it's power. For some, it's sexual perversion. For some, there's, and the, and the list, how I many know the list can go on ad nauseum? It can go on forever. 
But every one of us have the sin that so easily besets us. And in this generation, instead of identifying that sin and choosing to lay it aside, we have normalized it. That is like throwing mud in the eye of the great witnesses, the cloud of witness that we have. Every generation before us took those sins and crucified them at the cross. This generation, we prefer to pass laws to justify them. But let me tell you something. It still so easily besets you. It sets you on the wrong course. How many know you can get into power? And there's no such thing as politics goes on in a lot of denominations, are there? A lot of churches. There's no such thing as politics, is there? <laughs> Only if you've never been in a church bigger than 100. All this politics that goes on, and actually what it is, it's people's sin that so easily besets them, and it's besetting the entire church. But let's, look what it says here. Let us run the race with patience. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Every one of us have a race. Every one of us have a journey that we have to take. Every one of us. And Satan's job is to load you down that you can't do the walk. You know, if you can't do the walk, you don't have a testimony. You don't. How many know you can keep the Sabbath and not have a testimony? Just like you go to church on Sunday and not have a testimony. The testimony is that all the things that Satan put in your life to hold you down, to bind you up, there is a Savior that can set you free. That's the testimony. And then we can point to that he is the Lord of the Sabbath, but you've got to point to his power to deliver before the Sabbath even makes sense. Verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Jesus, the author and the finisher. He's the one who began it. He's the one that's going to finish it. How many of that you didn't get saved on your own? The Holy Ghost hunted you down. I like what John Bunyan called him, the hound of heaven. He hunted you down. He treed you. <laughs> he wouldn't let you go until you made Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life. How many are, are grateful for the annoying work of the Holy Spirit? Because he comes at the most inconvenient time to convict you of sin. He comes when it's not convenient sometimes, but he comes. But what I have found is what seems to be inconvenient to me or inconvenient is right before I go off a cliff and he has the audacity to set up a roadblock. Why? Because he loves us. In this verse, I'm, I'm, uh, what also comes to mind is the verse that he who has begun this good work in you is able to complete it. You're not required to complete your walk with God by yourself. It is God in you if you have confidence in him doing the work. Jesus is the author and he is the finisher. He is the architect and he is the one who goes. Have, have you ever built a house? You start with an architect, don't you? You start with somebody that knows what they're doing. If you don't have an architect design the house, the house probably won't stand. And I've been in a few houses. I remember years ago, Mary and I, when we were first looking for a house to buy, um, everything in this house was an afterthought. We didn't buy this house. The only way to find the living room is you went in the back door and somebody had to put a piece of cheese in the living room for you to be able to find it. I literally found, it's like you go down this corner, up this corner, down this corner, not this corner, you go down this corridor. I felt like a mouse in a maze trying to find the living room. And I thought, I'll, I don't want this house because if I got up in the middle of the night and had to go someplace, I would never find it unless I turned on all the lights. It didn't have an architect. But on the far end of it, there are some guys that if you've ever seen a house that's been finished, they go and they nail all the trim, they put all the purties up, and, and they shine all the doorknobs, make sure that everything is just in place. How I many know oh, Jesus wants to actively make sure that all the finishing touches to your life are there? Oh, we can have confidence in that. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Do you know what the prize that was set before him was? You. You. When he was on the cross, let me tell you something, the nails did not hold him to the cross. 
You think three hunks of steel can hold Jesus on a cross when a grave couldn't hold him down? They just simply gave him some place for him to hold on to while he was there because he saw you and he saw me and he saw the generations before us and if the Lord tarries a generation after us that we're going to come to him. And it was that joy set before him that he was able to endure the cross. And let me ask, let me tell you something. Sometimes some of the things that we need to go through in life, how I many there's going to be persecution for believers? How you get through it is you've got to look unto Jesus. If he went through the cross by looking at you, anything in your life you can do by looking to him. That's one of the secrets of getting through. Verse 3. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be weary and faint in your minds. When you look to Jesus, it helps you get through the tough spots. Never let the enemy get your eyes off of Jesus. And really the church, one of the, one of the problems with the church universal, if you will, is we have got our eyes on another Jesus. We have got our eyes on a Jesus that's easy. We got our eyes on a Jesus that doesn't require anything of you. We got our eyes on a Jesus that didn't really mean what he said and said what he meant. They're constantly skewing the words of Jesus, constantly skewing the words of the word of God to make it say something it never really meant. I see, anymore, I've been listening to some preachers here lately and I've had to quit. Because they use no hermeneutical principle whatsoever in their teaching. They jump from Scripture to Scripture. They use half of this and three-quarters of this and then a half-twist of this to make some brew. Let me tell you something. It ends up being a witch's brew if you're not careful. We've got to take it at plain value. And the, the thing that keeps us centered is Jesus, who he really is. He is Yahweh Elohim come in the flesh. He is the God who delivered Israel. He's the God who created man. He's the God who gave Moses the commandments. He's the God who anointed the prophets. He's the God who came and dwelt among us. Emmanuel, God with us. He came in, in flesh. He died on the cross for our sins, and his shed blood is what redeems us. He rose again three days later. Three full days later, by the way. Rose again victorious over death, hell, and the grave, and he's the God who's coming back. When I look to that... It helps me. It brings strength to me to go on. It says, and ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. How many know Jesus resisted unto blood? He went down the sides of the cross, didn't it? Let's go on a little bit further. For ye have forsaken the exhortation which uh, speaketh unto you as unto children, my son, despise not thou the chastising of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Now that verse you usually don't find underlined in most Bibles. Go ahead and underline it. Won't you go ahead and be the 1%? <laughs> underline that verse. He goes on, for, he and, for ye endureth chastising, God dealeth with you as a son, for whom son is he whom the father chastiseth not. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof are ye partakers, then you are bastards and not sons. Now that one people don't underline too often either. But let me tell you something, a believer that is never corrected of God is not a son. How many know there are a lot of things going on right now in the body, what we call the body of Christ, simply because they have church over their doorway when you come in church or assembly, that God doesn't correct anything there? It's a feel-good session. Let's feel good about you. And anything goes. There's no correction there. You know why God's not correcting it? Ain't his kids. They're not his kids. They can call themselves anything. This week I was praying about some things. You know, sometimes, you know, in ministry you're still dealing with some things of the past and every once in a while they'll come up and you think, boy, I wish I could have maybe done this different. Maybe if I'd have done this, it would have, it would have made a difference. And the Holy Spirit spoke up to me and said, so 
if you were figured out a new technique of putting lipstick on a pig, would it, still, would it have still been a pig? There are those that are his, and if they're not his, you can dress them like his, but in their heart, they'll never be his. And people that worry, am I really saved or not? Has God ever corrected you? Has God ever convicted you of something? Now, I'm not talking about a thundering hammer coming down from the sky and smashing you into a thousand pieces. What I'm talking about is him going, you quit doing that. Come on. Draws back your peace, convicts you a little bit. If you've ever had that happen in your life, you're saved. And all God's people said, Whew. <laughs> what worries me is I see a lot of preachers preaching that that have never been corrected of God. They, then they're trying to preach once saved, always saved. Are you convicted? Do you know what? Do you know what? Somebody that went to church that just went back into their sin, compare that to someone who was really serving God and fell into sin. Do you know how you can tell the difference in them? The one that really walked with God is absolutely miserable. Every breath is a labor to them, and the devil has, has sold them a lie. You can't get back. You know, you have, you have committed the unpardonable sin. Let me tell you something. If you have ever committed the unpardonable sin, you don't care. <laughs> you don't care. If there's no conviction, there's no sonship. And so I don't care how many they gather on the weekend in their services. If there's no conviction... There's no sonship. I've, I've had preachers, and I've, I've, I've actually heard the, the, on the crabs, the crab family. The, the son, what's his name, Jason? Jason Crab? He said, now, he, he went to this huge church, and they said, you know, we don't talk about the blood of Jesus here. We don't talk about sin here. And he kind of looked at him and said, I don't have anything left. <laughs> if I can't talk about those, that's what I sing about. I, I those that aren't family don't want to hear about it, but those that are family, we're saying, tell me that old, old story again. Tell me about the Savior who died for me. Love verse 9. Forevermore, or furthermore, he have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. How shall, shall we not much more Rather be subjection to the Father of spirits and live. When God convicts you, yield to it. Because the spirit of this world, the spirit that's functioning right now that's trying to take us away from the fire of God and prepare us for the tribulation period, if you will, the wrong way, says don't yield to him, don't give him respect. If I yield to the Father, I live. For they verily for a few days chastised us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. That's another word you don't hear too much in the body anymore, holiness. There's a song I was listening to this week that uh, it, it just raises up in my spirit. Let's get honest, let's get real, let's get holy. The Spirit of God is here. When God shows up, you want some holiness, don't you? You want some godly fear. When he's really here, it begins to change things in you. And it's for our profit. Now, no chastising for the present seems to be joyous but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised there. By. And so he's talking about, listen, right now with, a, I, I think a, there, there's this, there are two voices right now that are thundering. One's in harmony with the world and one's in harmony with the Spirit of God. One, the Spirit of God is trying to correct us. He's awakening us to the commandments of God. He's awakening us to the to ways of God. He's awakening us to the evils of paganism and how that it contaminates us and draws us away from God because all paganism draws itself from Babylon. And what Nimrod was was a mighty hunter against the Lord who drew men's souls away from God. And so the very foundation of all of that is to draw men away from God. 
And so we, we have that voice going on, and it's thundering through, uh, it's th- thundering through the Christian airways. It's thundering through the universities. It's thundering through the news agencies. It's thundering through the political scene. And then there's the voice of the Holy Spirit who's calling us to correction. And I think one of the reasons he's calling us to correction is we have got to be strong in God to walk not only in the blessings he wants to give us. This this is one thing I've had to deal with. I have had God withhold blessings from me because I wasn't ready for him yet. You're never going to give a son something that is going to be detrimental to them. It's like Eli and Nathan, now they're my grandsons, and I could give them a cap gun, I could give them squirt guns, and they, and they could play and have a great time, but would I give them a loaded shotgun? Now, I mean, when they get older, and they get go hunting and different things, you, and you train them, and you know that they are mature enough to receive that blessing, you can give them that blessing. But it would be dead, that blessing would be detrimental to them now. They would either shoot each other or blow big holes in the side of your house. And a lot of things God withholds from us because we have to receive the correction and the alignment to receive the blessing. At the same time, God corrects us so the devil doesn't get a major foothold in our lives to take us down. Because look what he says here. Let's go on. Wherefore, lift up the hands which are hung down and the feeble knees, I I like this next one, and make straight paths for your feet. That's talking about walking in holiness. That's talking about walking in the commandments of God. Lest that which is lame be turned out of the way and let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness. Follow peace and holiness. Follow peace and holiness. If you have a peace that is not twinned with holiness, is it the peace of God? These are some questions that we should be asking. Because we have, we have a lot of groups that talk about peace, peace, peace. And it's, let's just accept everything, peace. So, I, so in other words, I'm at enmity with God, but I'm at peace with everything of the world. True biblical kingdom peace or the shalom of God, you bring peace, but it, always, it is always twinned with holiness because you're supposed to be at peace with God, aren't you? Not at enmity with him. Look and diligently, look diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up, trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicators or profane persons as Esau, who for one morsel of meal sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. You know, there's a place that you can get in God, so far away from God, in other words, that you lose your blessing, you lose that position that you could have had. We were dealing with some of these things. I remember when I was in the Bronx and we were dealing with some of these things, and we were even dealing with King Saul. When King Saul messed up and it was like one too many times, and God says, you know you're going to die in battle? Well, the question was asked, well, because of the cross, couldn't he have repented? No. You know why? He went too far. This is warning us in the New Testament that if I allow sin to have its work, it could bring me to a place that I can't repent, even though I want to. There are people that, that have come to a place that God wanted this in their life, and as they were heading up toward that, they got so caught up in sin, even if they try to get back right with God, they'll never, ever achieve this in life. I don't want that to be said of me. I want to go on and really achieve that which he has called me to do. I'd hate to walk 55 years walking with God and then fall apart during the tribulation period. It's not those who begin the race, it's those who finish it. It's those who finish the race. 
So in this same context of all this, he said, For ye are not come unto the mount, unto the mount that uh, might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness or darkness and tempest, where the sound of the trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more. For they could not endure that which commanded, and if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned and thrust through with the dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly fearful and quite nice talking about Mount Zion, Zion or Mount Sinai. Now, the interesting thing, why, why can we come to a different mountain? Why does Mount Sinai not freak us out so much anymore? Number one, the fire that was on the mountain now dwells in you. It should, it should resonate with you, not freak you out. Because on the day of Pentecost, there was another Mount Sinai experience, but it was different. It was on Mount Zion. Sometimes we miss this. It was on Mount Zion. Mount Zion was where the upper room was because wherever the temple was, there was Mount Zion. They were, on, they were sitting on Mount Zion in the temple of God in an upper room when the Holy Ghost came and, and took the fire that was his off Mount Sinai and placed it in their hearts. But he's also telling us, listen, back then, they couldn't endure the word. It freaked them out. Now the word is being spoken directly to me. God is not taking me to a place of, 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 of not being able to receive what he's saying to me, but he's empowering me. He's empowering me by the fire that's within to hear what he's saying to me so that I can function with it properly. Can you see that here? Not, not unto Mount uh, Sinai, but look here, verse 22. But ye are coming to Mount Sion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to the innumerable, innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn. There's a, there's a whole series right there on teaching what the church of the firstborn is. It goes all the way back, back to the concept of Melchizedek, the priesthood of the firstborn that we have now been born into. And to God, the judge of all, and I want you to underline the next, the next part of this verse, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. That jumped out at the pages on me this week because that was the promise given to Abraham. Come walk before me and I'll make you perfect. Come walk before me and I'll make you complete. That word there is perfect is derived from teleos in the Greek, and it means to be mature, to have to not lack anything, but to have that which is complete. And so we're seeing here on Mount Zion where we have been called that men have received the blessing of Abraham, have received the calling of Abraham, received the anointing of Abraham, and are now justified before God by the blood of the Lamb and have matured. And he's saying, that is your example. Don't be like Esau, be like Abraham, and be like these just men made perfect. Perfection, what we call biblical perfection, doesn't mean without mistake. It means mature. That you're mature enough to look at a very, very tempting sin and say, I don't think so. I've come too far for that. I I'm not going to do that anymore. That sin that so easily beset me doesn't beset me anymore because I cast it off. I cut it off. I did away with it. And now I'm able to mature in God. And I love this. Not only are we coming to the general assembly, to the God, the judge of all, and to these spirits of men that have, have been made complete a Messiah, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant and of the sprinkling of blood that speaketh better thing than Abel. Oh, the sprinkling of blood. There's several kinds of sprinkling of blood in the, old, in the, in the Torah. How many know on the Day of Atonement there was a sprinkling on the right hand of God in the mercy seat of God? But there was also a time of sanctifying that the high priest would take the blood of the Lamb and he would sprinkle it on the people to sanctify them. 
The process of the Holy Spirit when I yield to his correction is he is actually sprinkling the blood of Jesus on me to sanctify me and to cleanse those areas. And the only way that it can be cleansed is I've got to receive the correcting power of the blood. Because that blood is speaking better things than that of Abel. It is saying you're better than this. I've created you not to, I have recreated you not to yield to this sin, not to be of the world, but to be of a greater kingdom. I'm going to say this. The blood of Jesus thinks better of you than you do. If you could get that this morning. I'm a failure. I'm never going to be happy. I'm never, all, all these lies the devil tells you, the blood of Jesus is speaking the opposite. You're complete in me. You have victory in me. I'll, I'll, son, just let me take your hands and I'll crucify that thing with you. I'll give you the power. I'll give you the grace. He said now, earlier he said now, there were those that fell from grace I don't know that necessarily, because I, I see that twofold, you can fall from grace and that you could be like Esau, that you're out. <laughs> but I think also we can fall short of the grace and that God gave us the grace to go through and we fell to the wayside. We fell from that grace to get us through. And the blood of Jesus is always empowering that grace. If I'll work with it, when, it, when that blood of sprinkling is upon me, I am receiving the grace to be a finisher of the fight, to be a finisher of that race. One of the things I pray over the next two weeks is that the Holy Spirit would open up your ears that you could hear what the blood of Jesus is saying about you. Because it's a lot different than what you're saying about yourself. Even if you're thinking good about yourself, it, there's probably still a difference. I remember years ago, I was after a time of fasting and prayer, and if you ever have a true prophetic vision, the color, it's more than three-dimensional. It's like five- or six-dimensional. The colors are more real. It, it's, it's more real than anything that we could ever do here. And as I was praying, God took me into the Holy of Holies, and I saw the mercy seat. And the mercy seat still holds the blood of Jesus, and that blood is still speaking. It's living blood, and it's still speaking. And what he allowed me to hear is, I will have a people, and they will be holy. The blood of Jesus is calling out, I will have a people come to me. Come to the cross. I will, I, I, I'm calling to convict you of your sins so that you can come to me. You've got to be convicted of the badness of Babylon before you can walk out and go into the promised land. And then that we're, we're going to be holy the way that God defines holiness. I want you to underline verse 25 because this needs to be the, from this day forward in your life, you need to make a quality decision of faith. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. God's speaking to you right now. Now, what's interesting is when you couple the concept of Zion and Mount Sinai with fire, we don't get what we call Pentecostal revival. What we get is the instruction of God's word with the fire to burn off what needs to be burned off and the fire to sear in what needs to be seared in. You cannot have the fire of God without the instruction of God coming alive in your life. It was out of the fire on Mount Sinai that the commandment. Guys, God took his finger and wrote in fire in solid granite or solid, you know, whatever they were made. I think they were made out of granite. Solid stone, the ten words. It's connected to the fire. Out of that fire came all the commandments of God. <coughs> so out of that fire also comes the instruction of God. After the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts, and you had all those people added, what happened? Every day the apostles went from house to house teaching. Not from house to house anointing, not from house to house having praise and worship sessions, not from house to house having evangelistic calls. That fire caused them to teach. 
So if we're saying we're having the fire of God and once the people get saved and we're not teaching, we're not really dealing with the fire of God. We're dealing with, we're, we're limiting it and we're dealing with our own concept of what revival should be instead of what God is saying. We have got to teach people, don't refuse what God is trying to speak into your life. Don't refuse him that speaks. But it goes on. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escape not who refused him that spoke on the earth, much more shall we not, or shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. There's always a price to be paid for not listening to God. Come on. And as the, as the days of Jacob's troubles gets closer and closer, the greater effect of not listening to him will have on us. Do you know what's going to ensure that you make it through? You better learn to listen. I have, I have personally talked to people that were living in Russia before communism kind of semi-pseudo fell down. It didn't really fall down. It just went and laid and waiting. They said, well, we'll just let it take over America and Europe, and then we don't have to fight. It's cheaper that way. But anyway, back then it was against the law, and you would, ha you would have the KGB show up and arrest Christians, put them in, in the gulags and stuff. And so how did you have church? Where did you have church? God told them, and they showed up. If you didn't get to hear from God that week, you didn't know where they were meeting because they never met in the same place twice. It also really, it really got to the place where you found out those that were really walking with God because they're the ones who showed up. And they learned... Just like there are Christians learning right now in China. You better follow what the Spirit of God says or you're going to end up in a re-educative camp. It's following God day in and day out when he says, turn right, turn right, turn left, turn left. How many times have we not listened that we got into an accident or, or some crazy thing that if we would have just listened to God? I haven't heard one uh, preacher that just really you know, really push his faith, you know, always keep your word. And he said, and finally he came to place, you know, I gave my word I was going to be there and I ended up in an accident on the way. If I would have listened to the Holy Spirit, I would have postponed the trip. I would, I would have done something. I would have called them and say, there's something not right. I need to wait a day or whatever. He said, if I would have just waited on God, I wouldn't have been in the hospital believing God for divine healing because there was no way out for me except by the hand of God. We read throughout the Word of God when they refused to hear God. How many know that while they were going 40 years in the wilderness, there was an entire generation dying out that never got into the promised land? I don't want you guys to be... Oh, uh, guys, uh, I... Not just, not just you guys here, but also all those associated with us. There, there has been a... Um, a worry... Come on me. Because I, I, every day I get emails from what people are going through, what pastors are going through, what people in the pews are going through. And sometimes, I mean, it, it, it's shocking. It's, uh, I, I have set reading emails of what people are going through and just begin weeping and crying, thinking, dear God, how did anything like that ever happen? And then you find out, I think if we could peel back all the onions of, of the situations in life, there was someone there that wasn't listening or listened to the wrong voice that precipitated a lot of these things. And it, it concerns me because I know, I know with what God wants to do in Mike Lake, I'm a pale comparison to where I should be. But you know what? I've woken up to that fact and I'm trying to take steps to get me where I need to be. And we're all that way. Because the, I woke up one morning and realized the blood of Jesus was speaking bigger things of me than I'm allowing myself to be. Come on. 
And if uh, throughout the word of God, if they didn't escape because they didn't listen, how are we going to, what excuse do we have? But here's where we're coming. I think we're coming to where we're, there, there is, uh, I don't necessarily believe in what we call dispensations or what we have made dispensational theology, but I think there's an overlapping of, of the different moves of God as, as he begins to establish his covenant. Remember when Jesus was with his disciples and there were some others that weren't his disciples that were preaching and he said, leave them alone? It was, it, was, it was almost like we were seeing the book of Acts before the book of Acts. Sometimes there's an overlapping. And so sometimes there will be a double fulfillment of prophetic word. There will be the ripple before the reality. And if you don't understand that, you'll confuse the ripple with the reality. And so I think we're going to have a ripple of what, is, is what goes on from 29 on. We're going to have a ripple of that before we have the reality of it because it's just like the feast. God does that in his graciousness to wake us up so that we can have a rehearsal before the real thing comes. Don't flunk the pop exam because the final exam's coming. Verse 26. Whose voice then shook the earth. Now, when he, now when he shook the earth, it, it shook the earth so much that even Moses. Now, let's, let's put this in contrast. All right, Moses saw the burning bush. He had God speak to him out of the burning bush. He could put his hand in his, in, in his coat, pull it out, it was leprous. He could put it back, it wasn't. He could take his staff, make it into a serpent. He went, and, and with that staff, nothing but that staff, he brought down the greatest military force on the planet. You don't think that's something? Go get a stick, go out here to Fellow's Lake and see if you can part it. Hold up that stick and see just how long it takes for that thing to part. After seeing all of that and witnessing all of that, he, he goes to show them. I, I wish I could just see Moses' face. Guys, I want to show you this burning bush. It is so cool. And he walks up and the entire mountain's on fire. <laughs> he said, what I left is this the bush. <laughs> and so after seeing all that, he looked at that and he said, oh, my. <laughs> That's what he's talking about here. That he said, now, listen, you think that was something? With what God's getting ready to do, he's not only going to shake the earth, he's going to shake the heavens. The earth part, can, can I be real honest with you? I will tolerate the earth part for what it will do in the second heaven. Because the second heaven is where all the principalities and powers are, are, are working and using man as, as nothing more than puppets. They love being Geppetto. And they love to work nations. Just, and, and God is saying, I'm going to knock them off their thrones. I'm going to shake everything they've ever touched in this earth. I'm going to shake everything they have ever touched in the heavens. I'm going to knock over their thrones. I'm going to knock over their altars. And yes, there are thrones and satanic altars erected in the second heaven over nations, but it's in the the second heaven. I can't get to those. I can't get to those. I'm stuck here on earth. And for some of us, gravity has a little bit more to hold on to than others. I can't go up there. But God is saying, what I'm getting ready to speak is going to shake just like Mount Sinai shook. And it's going to shake the heavens itself. That's why he says, see that you hear what he's saying. See that you hear what he's saying. And this word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that can be shaken as the things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Shaken is a good thing. Because all the junk that the devil put there is getting ready to get shook off. And I feel like right now what's coming to America, there is a, an awakening in America, and there's going to be a shaking in America if we will listen to what God is saying and quit playing church and quit playing who, who, can, who can attract the most bees with honey and give a strong word of what God is saying, we're going to be established in that shaking, and it's going to be for our benefit. Mary and I were talking last night, and she said, what, what, what kind is coming? And I said, I see the propensity or the potential for God 
to shake this nation so politically that many of those in power will cease being in power and it won't it, it will affect us in a positive way economically when all the nitwits quit nitwitting and keeping their thumb on everything if people will return to a godly morality the free market process works you take god out of it it won't work because men that are untrustworthy have to be under oppression to be controlled. But godly men, it kind of, I'm, wanting to go, I'm wanting to go back to the day that I don't have to have a 50-page contract and 60 lawyers behind me that have already figured out a way of getting out of that. I want a man's handshake to be his bond. You see, when you got that, free enterprise works. Because I think, there's, I think there's going to come a time of prosperity if God can shake the things out of the way. And I think we've just begun to see the, the beginning of the scandals. And it's not going to be just a Democratic scandal. It's going to be a Democratic scandal. It's going to be a Republican scandal. It's going to be a scandal. Every single division of our government that has left the ways of God or have tried to fight God in one way or another are getting ready to be shook for your sake, for my sake. So that which God established may remain. You see, there was a destiny that God had for this nation, and it wasn't what the Freemasons wanted. It wasn't what the occultists wanted. God had his plan in the midst of their plan, and he says, you know what? When the time is right, I'm going to get to talking, and it's going to shake all your junk off. And what I planned is going to remain. Pull out your pen again because... Verse 24, you need to understand. Wherefore, we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be moved. Therefore, wherefore we are receiving. That is a perpetual tense. It is a current tense. It is not completely here yet, but as God speaks, it enables me to receive. So if God is rocking and rolling and God is shaking some things, hold on to the kingdom, hold on to God, because that is a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And we're receiving that if we hear. Hear what? Hear his instruction. What is the Holy Spirit instructing you? People that always say, no, God just promises me blessing, but does he give you any instruction with it? No, just that he's going to bless me. He's going to bless me. He's going to bless me. He don't work that way. He does not work that way. Every commandment of God is connected to a promise of God, and he has to instruct you on how to walk in that commandment to activate the promise. If he could bless you without the, without the commandment, then we'd find it all throughout the word of God. It never is that way. You got saved by keeping out a commandment. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. If you don't believe, you're not saved. It's a commandment. Belief is a commandment. Let us have grace. Why? To walk in it. To walk in it. Grace is the power of God to walk in his kingdom. Whereby we may serve God acceptably, acceptably with reverence and holy fear that's something you don't hear too much from the pulpit anymore either or see very much from the pulpit is reverence for God and holy fear they reverence the offering plate we have a lot of ministries that reverence the people because if I really preach the word everybody will leave this, uh, this week on, on Facebook one of, the, one of the guys from Word search, one of the Bible programs I put, said, how important is prayer to sermon preparation? <laughs> that was like saying, sick him to a dog for me. And I read some of their comments. Well, it probably is kind of important. Well, I don't know. You know, I can, I can, just, I can do it without it. You know, that's why we have Bible search. I bought the, mm, oh. And so I wrote, you know what? It's paramount to sermon preparation. Because if you don't hear from heaven, you can't speak for heaven. And you don't, you don't, you're not giving a sermon, you're giving a speech. And I wanted to write what any jackass can do. 
because we've had donkeys give speeches before. It's return. If there's no godly fear, then I'm just putting together what I think everybody needs to hear to make them feel good. Judson Cornwell, in, in his uh, in his book on leadership, says we have too many men that have never been to the mountain and seen the burning bush. Therefore, they never come down with they never come down from the mountain with the word. They're always trying to dig up something new to preach. I never have to dig up something new. I'm letting heaven speak to me all week. Oh, man. Reverence and godly fear. If you have that in humility in your life, then you're walking with God. And if you've been touched by God, you've been touched by the fire, those are the responses. Because speaking about fire, why, why, is that a, why is that a proper response of reverence and godly fear for our God is a consuming fire? Put that in context. Don't take that away and say, oh, I can't come near him because I'll be consumed. I want to be consumed in God. Because he becomes like the fiery furnace that everything that bound me up and held me back is consumed. And I'm walking around in the fire with the, third, with the fourth man in the fire. I was created to walk in the fire. This world burns up in the fire. I need God in my life to be a consuming fire. It needs to burn up my past and all the vain imaginations I've had and all the vain philosophies I've had and all the concepts the devil taught me in the school of hard knocks because I wouldn't let the Holy Spirit teach me, so the devil taught me instead, and he was teaching me all the wrong things. I need that burned up. And I can, now, I can either embrace the fire now or embrace the fire later. Because it, it, here's where, where I really think heaven is speaking. It's like when you look at pruning. Jesus teaching, you know, uh, those that produce fruit, God's going to prune so they may produce more fruit. Those that don't produce any fruit, they're pruned too. The difference is the depth of the pruning. You're pruned if you do and pruned if you don't. You're, you're, you're placed in the fire one way or another. I can either have the fire of God's presence or the fire of persecution. Either way, I'm going to get the fire. Choose the first fire. Hear and let that voice shake everything out of you that can be shaken. So that when the per true prophetic shaking of what we see happening in the book of Revelation comes, you're not moved because there's nothing within you that will resonate with the world. That makes you unmovable and unstoppable. That almost sounds like a contrast, doesn't it? Or, 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 or uh, an oxymoron. I'm unmovable, but I'm unstoppable. How can you be unstoppable if you're unmovable? That's like a moving mountain, isn't it? <laughs> the world can no longer move me. And I can, when, when a believer's really walking right, you can walk right in the middle of the wrath of God being poured out and not be touched. God will always make a Goshen for you. In Isaiah, there were men that had to go through this. I think it was Isaiah. Men that had to go through, it may have been Ezekiel, that they had to go through and mark the men that were walking with God, and at the same time, there's the wrath of God being poured out. How many of the guys with the pins didn't have to worry about it? You can walk through things that you never believed you could walk in if you're in the right place, and what is being judged is not resonating with you, but the voice of God is. God is calling us to a realignment with his voice like no other generation before us because there is a fire coming like no generation before us. There's a fire of hell coming, and it will, it will embrace everything that resonates with it, and there's a fire of God coming and only those things that resonate with it will come under its protection and its purifying ability. Thank God our God is a consuming fire. There's things in Mike Lake that the presence of God needs to consume. There are things in your life God needs to consume. There are bondages in your life. The devil has you all tied up. The fire of God can burn those away and to set you free and empower you. See? He said, yeah, listen to him. <laughs>
but I've got to choose to hear. Hear him who speaks. I have learned, even if I'm up in the office and I'm going 500 miles an hour trying to get things done, you know, we, we, I'll have students calling and campuses wanting to graduate. I had that happen. I was right in the middle of graduating all these students this week for our, our school up in New York, and guys started talking to me, and I just stopped. I sat down. You're talking. I quit working. That's when he took me to Hebrews chapter 12 and says, I'm going to show you some things. After he finished talking, I went back to working because they'd like to graduate. But we need to learn to be that sensitive to God speaking to us. And my prayer for you is that God would sharpen your ears, that we would not be dull of hearing, but acute of hearing to the voice of God. Let us be deaf to the world and attuned to God in every single area of our lives. Father, I thank you for your word. Father, I thank you. Thank God there is a shaking coming. It may be a shaking that is an echo of the real shaking to come, but Father, we need it. Father, we need it. Father, there needs to be a removing of all the things the enemy has built up to take, draw men away from you so that the true kingdom can shine before judgment comes. And Father, we, we ask that you would give us grace to hear your words and to, to walk in your kingdom and to lay aside every weight that so easily besets us so that we could walk with you. We choose to be like Jacob that hungered for the blessing of God and hungered for that walk with God. And we refuse to be like Esau that thought our walk with God was just a thing easily to be sold for a mere morsel of food. Father, make it so in our lives. Clear our vision, clear our ears so that those who have ears to hear can always hear what the Spirit of God is saying. And Father, we ask for it. We beseech you for it this morning. In Jesus' name.